Uh, uh, Heather, come on up. Thank you for that nice, nice introduction. Um, I'm here today not necessarily to give you an overview of what my company does, but to sort of look at a more uh, topical um, item here, which is privacy and how that intersects AI developments today. So as we all know, there's been a lot of excitement, a lot of investment around AI technologies and AI companies. Uh, I've been doing this for 15 years. When we first started doing this uh, in 2006, Max, myself, and our third co-founder, Anatoly, we wrote a patent on developing AI algorithms on GPUs. We were really excited about the work that we had done, so we did what any entrepreneur does, is we called up NVIDIA. And we said, hey guys, uh, we've developed this patent, we want to start building our systems on your, on your GPUs, can we do that with you? And they hung up on us. Um, you know, and now today, NVIDIA is leading the charge in a lot of AI development. So it's been a long road. Um, we, we've stayed the course, and as you can see from these charts, uh, the development, the financing, and the investment just continues to grow year after year, and will continue to do so into the future. So AI is here to stay, and it's here to make a lot of money. But this all rests on the foundation of data. <clears throat> so for AI to change business, it needs to be fueled by quality data and a lot of data. So you put good data into the system, you can get good predictions out of the system. And just the same is that if you put bad data into the system, you're going to get bad predictions out of the system. So it's really important for us to focus in on the issue of data today. Luckily for us, the internet is a gold mine of data. There's mountains of data that cross through the internet every day. Just thinking about right now in this talk, we have lots of people with their laptops open, maybe people with uh, tweeting or having conversations, maybe you're discussing, maybe you're discussing AI, I hope, um, and that's generating a lot of data. We're taking video of it. It just keeps aggregating over and over and over again. So there's about 2.5 exabytes of data are produced every day. This is the equivalent of 530 million songs, 150 million iPhones, 5 million laptops, 250,000 libraries of Congress, 90 years of HD video. Wow, this is awesome for us as AI developers. So much data, isn't this great? Well, there's a problem, right? A big problem. How many of us in this room today are interested in sharing your personal data, your likeness, pictures of your children, the things that you do from day to day, your activities, or the things about your business, how much money you're making, who you're talking to. How, mu how many of you guys want to share that data if I tell you share this data and we'll build a better AI system? It sounds pretty scary. It sounds like Skynet. Often people ask us if we're building Skynet. Luckily, we're nowhere near that today. Um, but, but it's a problem. Nobody wants to share that data. I don't want to share that data necessarily. And in fact, many users, both consumers and enterprise businesses in the United States and Europe, do not want to share this data unless condu two conditions are met. Number one, there's a clear benefit to them. So for example, if you were told that somebody was going to monitor your bandwidth, like when you use Netflix at home, to determine when that bandwidth is highest so that they can then provide you better services during the time period when you want to watch your favorite shows on TV, that's great, that's a benefit to you to develop an algorithm that can help you to, to improve your Netflix watching. Um, but if they're going to monitor your bandwidth so that they can then you know, uh, charge you more or slow you down, you don't want to share that information. So there needs to be a very clear way that you benefit people by sharing that information. And the second, and this is a big one, is the consent for the specific use. So earlier when I talked to you about taking all of your personal data to build a better AI system, I didn't really tell you how I was using it, right? People want to know how you're using that data. They want to be, they want knowledge, okay? And in fact, this year, GenPAC reported that 71% of more than 5,000 consumers polled in the US, UK, and Australia said they didn't want companies to use AI that threatens to infringe on their privacy, 
even if it is to improve customer experience. So there's really more information that people want to know about how their data is being used. Telling them that their experience is going to be better isn't enough. And of course, we saw this with all the fun of Facebook recently, where roughly 87 million users' data was affected with the Cambridge Analytica, Analytica scandal, Mark Zuckerberg testifying at Congress, and I like this quote here, it really gets to the point of the issues that the government is seeing and how we're protecting privacy. Your user agreement sucks. The purpose of the user agreement is to cover Facebook's rear end. It is not to inform your users about their rights. The average American needs to understand. People in this country want to know how their data is being used and how you're using it to build these systems. And in Europe, they're taking this a step further by enacting uh, a lot of legislation around data privacy, specifically asking for affirmative consent to use European residents' personal information for building AI systems, advertising, and whatever other uses that they may have. And many people in this country are asking themselves, maybe we should take a lesson from European policymakers and enact similar legislation here. <clears throat> but this isn't the case everywhere in the world. So across the globe in China, it's a very different story. This is a surveillance state. There's cameras everywhere. They're recording video. They're tracking personal data. They're monitoring the internet. Everywhere you look, data is being collected about the citizens or visitors of the country. <clears throat> and for the most part, the people there, they're OK with it. And if they had an opportunity to voice their consent, they'd probably give it, but they don't really have that opportunity. So what we have happening in China today is a lot of surveillance, a lot of technology innovation, and a lot of data fueling those advancements happy pictures of people doing photo editing, retail um, plays, and just general surveillance of the, of the people there. Furthermore, the government in China has a mandate to become the world leader in AI by 2030. Let's think about that. That's a pretty big statement. And for China, this means that they're not only gathering all of this data, they're sharing that data with the companies inside of their country, and they're investing a lot of money a lot of resources into developing the AI systems within the borders. <clears throat> and we're starting to see this come to fruition. So China now has the most valuable AI startup in the world, which is called SenseTime. SenseTime has raised an amazing $600 million from Alibaba and others at a valuation of more than $3 billion, becoming the world's most valuable artificial intelligence startup. This is amazing, you know, and we look at SenseTime almost every day, you know, it's, it's a big competitor of ours. And truthfully, the technology isn't out of this world astounding technology. It's simply a lot of researchers and a lot of access to data and resources within China that's allowing them to make these advancements so quickly. So for others like ourselves at Narala, we find ourselves sort of at a crossroads. And this crossroad is, do we continue down the road, call ourselves ethical, for lack of a better word, maybe lose the AI race, where we respect privacy of users, and maybe we lose access to all these mountains of data that have personal information. Maybe we produce a lower quality AI. Or do we take this road that we're maybe seeing across the globe, sort of an unethical winner, we just completely forget about privacy and harvest as much data as we possibly can to potentially build a higher quality AI system? It's a tough question. So can we build a competitive AI system in a private society that competes with countries like China where privacy is ignored and data access is virtually unlimited? We like to argue that there's maybe a third path. Luckily, it's not so grim. Um, and, and that's what I'll present today, sort of what Nerala is doing today um, to combat this issue. In order to understand that, let's look at how traditional AI systems are built. So they use very, very, very large data sets, lots of compute power to, power to process those data sets. So I read this morning an article that Facebook used 3 billion Instagram photos of hashtags of things like cats, dogs, statues, 
to uh, improve their image recognition AI system, and they gained 2% accuracy over the state of the art by using 3.8 billion photos, crunching those numbers over months to get there. So that, that's a lot of effort to build this system to get 2%. And how is this trained? It takes a long time to train these systems. We do thousands, millions of iterations of the same data, millions of pieces of data iterated millions of times, trying to find a convergence of the best performing system you can possibly get. And at the end of the day, you get what we call a fixed brain. It's done learning. So it'd be as if I told you guys today, here's the end point of your learning. You will learn no more going into tomorrow. So there are three fundamental issues in traditional AI. First is that we need massive amounts of data. And the reason we need it is we need to make generalizable predictions about the world around us. So you need to have millions of pictures of cats to know what a cat is. And you need to store that data because you can't add knowledge to it, which is the third, third issue that we like to discuss. You can't add knowledge to that, that model without completely retraining the system. So this is the key fundamental issue of this, is the training. So if you take, for example, if you built an AI system that recognizes produce, <clears throat> and the engineer that, that built the system, he hates apples. For some reason, he hates them. So he built a produce model that recognizes cucumbers and oranges and bananas and tomatoes. He sends it out to the grocery stores being used, and this grocery store is running a special on apples, and it misclassifies apples, doesn't know what it is. So you want to add that knowledge of an apple. Well, what you would need to do you would need to retrain the whole data set just to add that new piece of information. So send it back. Train it for a few days, weeks, until you get convergence again with that new information. So in order to be able to learn any new information, you have to keep all of that data and store it and retrain it over again. This means that AI is at a technology stalemate. To perform, these systems need massive amounts of data and to store it. But by keeping all that data, privacy and confidentiality can be violated. You need a lot of data, you have to store it, there's a lot of potentials for failure. We argue that there's a third way, which is what we call the brain way. <clears throat> so if we think about how we interact as, in the world as humans, we know that we do not need to retrain all of our life experiences to learn something new every day. So this is probably many of you, your first encounter of hearing me speak and now you're learning who I am, you're learning the voice, you're learning the content of what I'm talking about today, but after I'm done talking, you're not gonna close your eyes and take a nap for eight hours just to add that information to your brain. It adds automatically on the fly. And so that's when we developed what we call lifelong deep neural networks. So this technology that we developed started with our work in the SBIR program with NASA, where they asked us to build an artificial intelligence that can explore and learn day after day, but only use onboard compute power and not ping back to central command on Earth. And through that program and developing that technology, we also knew that this is similar to problems that you find on Earth, which is that the world around you is constantly changing. And you need to build a system that learns with you. So Narala built an AI that learns locally on device and does not need to store all of that data. So whereas traditional DNNs need massive data sets, large servers, a lot of time to compute, and outputs a static brain, Narala strives to use less data, locally learn and compute, and do that instantaneously so that we can learn day after day and add knowledge as we go. <clears throat> and this shows you, again, the conventional DNN taking a significant amount of time for training, Whereas with our system, we have instantaneous convergence and learning of new items uh, immediately on the device and locally. Here is just a quick video of showing one of our earlier demonstrations showing on an iPad how we can learn about a cup. Just with a few frames of a video, label that and then show it another cup and it can generalize that learning to another cup. And then we can also add other categories, such as a car, and now I can recognize the car and the cup. So we're really excited about this technology. We, we work very hard to get it into a very small memory footprint, very fast inference time to be able to run locally on mobile devices. So LDNN today is a reality. 
Currently, we have deployed in tens of millions of mobile devices from smartphones, and we're working with Teal to deploy in their drones by the end of the year, with the key innovation being that all the learning occurs on device and doesn't require retraining and storage of that data in order to learn again, and thus attempting to maintain user privacy and to move past this dilemma that we're seeing today between AI and privacy. So we argue that there is a light at the end of the tunnel, and that really comes in the ability to compute locally, not store a lot of data, and offer customized user experiences, which allows people to learn locally rather than using massively large data sets. Here's a picture of our team, um, and thank you, Paleon, for inviting us here today. <laughs>